Following the 1996 success of their lovable orange marsupial, Naughty Dog realized they were onto something big. 1997 rolled around and Crash Bandicoot was back in a whole new adventure, pumped and ready to take on Dr. Cortex and his minions yet again. The intro cutscene picks up right where the last game left off, with Cortex falling from his purple dirigible. Crash just beat his ass, won back his woman, and pulled some major Grand Theft blimp. My hero. Amazingly, Cortex survives the fall with hardly even a scratch, and begins hatching his new evil plan of doom, and evil, and doom, and evil. Gather up a bunch of powerful mystical crystals and a giant tractor beam in space and use them to blow up the world. Huh. Seems a little bit excessive to me, but you know, if it works. With the help of his new henchman slash possible love interest, Dr. Engine. <laughs> Get it? Engine? <laughs> so, they discuss a method for retrieving the crystals. Having no allies, Cortex decides to send an enemy. If we don't have any friends left on the surface, then we need to find an enemy. Now we're introduced to Crash hanging out in the jungle with his sister Coco. At this point, if you're anything like me, you're wondering, who the hell is that? Whatever happened to Crash's big booby hoochie mama, Tana, or whatever her name was? Who's this overall wearing bitch? I don't care about her. Well, some people say Tana ran off with Pinstripe. You know that insane mafia boss shooting the fuck out of his office from the first game? Apparently, somewhere it once said something like that, but what I think actually happened is a couple of big, overweight, middle aged God Squad soccer moms were made very angry when they saw this big breasted bitch in a game kids could play. All fat, annoying mothers everywhere merged into this giant, horrendous blob named Super Bitch, and they complained to Naughty Dog. They had but no choice than to submit to Super Bitch's pointless cries of women jibber jabber. Yar, she then returned to the center of the earth to rest, until something else would invoke the PlayStation dumping kids all across the world. Yar. Anyway, you finally get to start playing this game after Coco bitches about her laptop battery dying. She tells you to go bring her another one, and I don't know exactly what the hell she means. You're in the middle of the goddamn jungle. Where the hell are you supposed to find a battery? Crash decides to play along and get up and go look for one anyway. Either just to shut her up or get away from her for a few minutes. So now you walk down a path for a bit, Crash is abducted and teleported to the warp room, where he's greeted by Dr. Cortex, who's now claiming he's a good guy. Crash doesn't realize this is a lie yet, but we sure do because we're the player and we're smart. He also tells us that we need to gather up some crystals, so he can use them to save the world somehow. Actually, he's planning to destroy the world, we knew that the whole time, because we're the player and we're smart! In every level, you collect crystals and gems. Crystals being the critical path, basic required collectibles that you need to get. And the gems are just kind of a 100% replay value kind of thing, you know what I mean? So Cortex wants to use the crystals to destroy the world, claiming to use them for good. Then you eventually get talked to by Cortex's ex-lover, Nitrous Brio, who tells you that the gems are actually good and the crystals are bad. At this point, it would've been cool if they could do like a split path kind of thing, like if you decided you didn't want to get any crystals and could only get gems, but that's not possible. You have to get crystals in order to finish the game. You actually have to get five in every warp room to go to the next warp room, so... They could have did that, that would have been awesome. If you could actually have two different paths you can choose to take. Get a little bit different story or ending. But, no, they didn't do that. Alright, now let's actually play this game. If you know anything about Crash Bandicoot gameplay, you'll know that it's extremely linear. And Naughty Dog has chosen categories of levels that fit that perfectly. These levels can be broken up into 11 different categories, such as... Jungle Snow River Chase Bear Riding, Sewer, Aztec Ruins, Snowy Jungles with Bees, Can't See Shit, Space, and Jetpacks. The jungle levels carry over the most from the first Crash game. You walk down a path, through a jungle, with trees, and rocks, and other jungly aesthetic details surrounding you. Your obstacles include strategically placed pitfalls for you to stumble into if you're not paying attention, quicksand to muck you up and slow you down, and an assortment of enemies ranging from armadillos, turtles with spikes, turtles with saws, and evil pink cyborg birds. A newer feature since Crash Bandicoot 1 is the advent of the Nitro Crate. Similar to the TNT, but completely different because this one explodes on direct contact. Just stay the hell away from it. Another slight obstacle as a whole that isn't totally a pitfall, but if you fall in, you get ambushed by some kind of little rodent guys. 
Either fight them off and wait for a bouncy mushroom to appear to get yourself out, or say screw that and just jump out. In fact, this part's so broken you never have to deal with it because you can just jump over it in the first place. There are actually a few parts where you aren't constrained to the main path, breaking the linearness just a little bit. Such as forks in the road, but not quite the extent as they were in Cortex Power and Crash 1. And a few secret paths here and there to give you the option to do something or not. That's kind of the definition of non-linear. In Crash 2, we also get to see an upgraded bonus round system since the one in Crash 1. As opposed to picking up icons of various characters in the game, bonus rounds are now represented by question marks. These are in the form of platforms that magically levitate and take you away, or give away floors or just straight up looking holes that you fall through and break your legs. Either way, these all take you to separate side-scrolling paths, where you can gather up extra wampas and lines and get a few crates. I think only one bonus round in the game actually allows you to see the main path of the level while being on the bonus round. I find this kind of thing pretty cool. I wish they managed to pull it off in a few more places. Now you go through your level and when you reach the end you'll be greeted by this big door. When you get in here you'll either be greeted by a counter showing you how many boxes of how many boxes you have out of how many boxes are in the level. Or if you have them all you're greeted by a gem. This is nearly 100% of the time going to be a clear gem, or I think it looks more like it's made out of aluminum. But in this very first level, if you get zero boxes, you get a blue gem. How cool are you? Moving on, we now have snow levels. These are levels where it snows, and it's covered in snow because of the snow. But you best watch your step, because this cold weather has created some ice! That almost certainly happens to be lubed up with some KY jelly, making it almost impossible to go in a direction that's semi-useful. Using slide helps a little bit, but you usually just end up way overshooting. Combine this with hectically placed nitros, falling ice, pitfalls, random crushers, penguins and seals all getting up in your shit, and then you have an idea of what to expect for the separate gem routes and death routes in these kind of levels. Yeah, they can be a pain in the ass. So when it comes to getting this red gem, just jump and get it. But if you don't feel like being a cheat-worthy bastard, make your way to the secret warp room and take the secret entrance. Now, these river levels are the first introduction to a vehicle in any Crash game. First. Ever. First. 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 I call first. They tried to cash back in on this idea in Crash 3, but they way overdid it and made it annoying. But that's for another video. The vehicles in Crash 2, however, don't feel intrusive. Meaning when a vehicle situation arises, you don't feel the instant need to pass the controller to your girlfriend and make her play that shit. Keeping the fun levels for yourself. Really, these ones are fun, easy to control, don't detract from the experience, and you don't mind doing it yourself and you'll actually have fun. When you're on your jet board, you risk getting sucked into whirlpools, crashing into nitros and bombs, and also getting some air jetting off of those ramps. Whilst not on your two-dimensional jet board riding down the river like Huckleberry Finn, this level includes falling into the water and drowning like a wuss, getting eaten by giant man-eating plants and starving piranhas, jumping across timed platforms and hip-hop anonymouses. We are now on to the chase levels. This refers to being chased, usually by a Raiders-esque giant boulder. This did happen in Crash Bandicoot 1 a few times, but in Crash 2 they changed it up a little bit. For instance, you now have more shit getting in your way, such as a few lizardly enemies, bombs, fences, and bazillion volt electrical arcing electricalness. However, these arrow strips on the ground usually work to your advantage, giving you a boost of speed. Just be sure you know what lies ahead, as you may end up getting boosted right into a hole. You can also be chased by a big pissed polar bear. You can even outrun them on a tiny polar bear. Speaking of the tiny polar bear, it's time to talk about the bear riding levels. Sometimes this can be fun, but other times it can be damn right annoying with assholey placed boxes, which require pinpoint accuracy and the reaction time of Spider-Man. Even when you know where they are and what to do, sometimes they can still be pretty tricky. While blazing through this valley of snow-covered goodness, you'll be dodging guys pointlessly lifting steel crates, dodging seals, dodging totem poles, dodging TNTs and nitros, dodging whales that jump out of tiny little ponds, dodging, 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 that's all you gotta do. If you're going for all the crates, you might need to charge once or twice in there, but for the most part, it's just dodging. In a way, this can be classified as a vehicle, even though it is just a bear, but it is an external means of transportation used to vary up the gameplay. Call it whatever you see fit. 
Moving right along to the sewer levels. These have a very great art direction in them to try to make a sewer a little bit more interesting. Cylindrical hallways, huge clusters of pipes, grates to walk on, and all kinds of cool shit like that. I really enjoy this, it's the epitome of the Naughty Dog look. Down in the sewer, your enemies are electric eels in little pools. If you're in there when they decide to zap, you'll be dead. Spiky rat guys that you gotta jump on, and scrubbing bubbles. Yes, the toilet cleaning mascot Scrubbing Bubbles does make an appearance. These guys can easily just be spun away, but they can be spun away into a fan that's blocking your path. Just knock them in there, break off the blades, and you're good. You also have one of these lab assistant guys who's shooting fire all over the place. Just make sure his torch goes out and you kick him in the face. In these levels, we also have a new mechanic that wasn't used nearly as much as it should have been, and that's the monkey bars, climbing around like a monkey. Not on a bar, but more on a great, like, thing. This new means of navigation is a very cool way to break up the gameplay. When just walking down a path or a tunnel gets old, start climbing about. And the new obstacle here is avoiding hot pipes, hot floors, whatever, even lava sometimes. Why there's all this hot shit and lava in a sewer, I have no idea. Now we're to the Aztec ruins. These levels are pretty cool. It's nighttime, there's rain, storm, thunder, lightning, and they offer some really great platforming parts. Avoid getting your ass roasted by flame-spitting stone faces. Be sure to slide this lizard guy. Spin away or jump on these little rat-like guys. And dodge the logs thrown by Donkey Kong. And I just realized pretty recently that you can actually spin these logs away. <sighs> God, if only I knew that when I was younger. We also got a few cool moving platforms, such as these slippery pillars. And it's only used seven times in the whole game and these rotating green cracker things. We also got some platforms that fall. Pretty self-explanatory, just don't stand on them for very long. We are now to the snowy jungles with bees. This may sound silly, but it's the best way to classify these levels. You're in a jungle-looking environment, and it's snowy. Not totally snow-covered, and there's no ice, so it's not quite like the other snow levels. But there is snow here, and there are bees. To avoid invoking your allergies and having to take a trip to the hospital, you can dive underground and never have to worry about getting stung. But just be careful, because if one of these hammer-wielding, flannel-wearing bastards shows up, you're toast. You're already pre-buried. You even dug your own grave. We have a similar enemy to the man-eating plant. This is a living plant, but rather than eating you, he shoots bombs at you. And this weird stone totem face that doesn't really seem to do anything. It just kind of morphs its face and moves about, and if it touches you, you're screwed. But it really doesn't pose much of a threat because it doesn't aim for you or anything, it just moves around in a set pattern. Probably one of the most bizarre enemies in this game. We also have some more super high voltage electric arc gates used to screw you up when trying to get away from bees. The next set of levels is Can't See Shit. These levels, you can't see shit. They're pretty much variations on previous levels, but somebody's turned the lights off. There are, I think, two jungle ones which required you to get a firefly to help light it up a little bit so you can see what the hell you're doing. But eventually, the firefly decides to fuck off, so if you don't have a new one in time, you're stuck in the dark. And there's also a bear riding one. People say this is the hardest bear riding level in the entire game, but I actually think it's the easiest and the most fun. I don't know, that just might be me, though. One of the jungle ones and the bear riding one are access through the secret warp room. And then the last jungle one is in the last warp room. These levels may seem cheap, but they're actually kind of fun and twist up the gameplay in a new challenging way. I personally like the idea of the way they did it in Crash 2, unlike Crash 1 where it's actually Aku Aku, who's your light source. Because if you take a hit, your light's out. And that just made it more hard than fun. Now let's journey to the final frontier as we go into space. With the levels spaced out and pissed in a way, I actually can't tell any resemblance that this is supposed to be in space, but I just assume that you're on a space station. But there are no windows or stars in the background or planets or anything to give that indication, but well, let's just roll with it. Most of these enemies I'm going to have a hard time describing, but they're all pretty much just robots. One really weird looking chicken legged one that you need to slide, and this one that crawls along the ground with arms that are sometimes electrified and sometimes above him and sometimes on the side and sometimes they change. Sometimes they're even levitating in the air. This adds a timing challenge to how you're supposed to kill them, integrating the enemies with the platforming. We also have crushers and inverted crushers. The inverted ones giving you an elevator-like thing or a platform extender to get higher or farther jumps. We also have some moving floating platforms that you can't touch the sides of without getting burned. 
and lab assistants with riot shields that try to push you into nitros and off ledges and all that kind of shit. And we also got shrink rays that just shrink you until you're dead. There's also another really cool art direction here. I like the pipe design, all the platform design, the background design. It's all really cool. And speaking of really cool, what is cooler than a jetpack? Yes, in Crash 2, Crash flies a jetpack. The last vehicle you come into contact with in this game, and it feels a little bit clunky at first, but once you get the hang of it, you're all good. It's vaguely similar to the Polar Bear, whereas almost 100% of the level is comprised of just using the vehicle, apart from the very beginning and very end of the levels. But it's really not that big of a deal, it's actually kind of enjoyable. You actually get to utilize your third dimension to its fullest. Not only being able to go left and right and forward and backward, you can also go up and down. However, and whenever you want, to your heart's content. Your obstacles include avoiding exposed wiring, some more hot shit, lasers, more nitros and TNTs, weird circular rotating bomb thingies, and some lab assistants that have electrical magical powers. I don't know if you could consider it platforming, but the way you have to navigate through these levels is fairly unique, especially when this game was made. You had to think in an extra dimension just to get around, which is still a little bit baffling these days. Moving up and down, left and right, forward and backward to dodge things and progress forward. It's a pretty cool thing, especially for back then in 97. That's about enough for all the levels in Crash 2, but we didn't even talk about any of the bosses, so let's do that. Ripperoo, who carried over from Crash 1, the insane blue kangaroo. That sounded like Dr. Seuss. He likes to hang around in waterfalls. Presumably this is the same waterfall from Crash 1 where you blew his ass up. And you end up doing pretty much the same thing here, just a little bit different execution. He pretty much actually just ends up blowing himself up. And then you spin him in the face! New to the series is the Komodo Brothers. These two stooges are pretty dorky. Mo and Joe, the knife-wielding reptiles. All you pretty much gotta do is stay away from them and spin them when they screw up. And dodge a couple of flying swords. Next up is Tiny Tiger. This guy's a dumbass. He'll chase you around at all costs, even if it means falling to his death. He's got some great theme music composed by the legendary Josh Mansell. Now we make it to Cortex's lover, Dr. Engine! He's such a pussy. He's gotta use a damn mech. It's not that he's difficult or anything, he just gets to shoot rockets and lasers at you from a giant robot, while you're only protected by your pants, throwing wampas at him. And finally is Dr. Cortex himself. The easiest final boss in any video game ever. This epic space chase on jetpacks ends rather abruptly, when all you gotta do is spin him three times and he explodes. Just be sure you kill him before he gets to this finish line, but honestly, if you can't kill him before he gets here, you suck at life. <laughs> and that's nearly it for Crash Bandicoot 2. But what about all the gems? Well, if you get all 42 gems, you get a secret 100% ending. This consists of a rather epic shot of every gem you have collected and Nitrous Brio's gigantic laser, and he uses his laser to blow up Cortex's laser. And you have done well. You have 100%. I wish it was just a little bit more rewarding than a 10 second cutscene followed by 5 minutes of unskippable credits. But what are you gonna do? Crash Bandicoot 2, it's a great game. But don't take my word for it, go play it yourself. It still holds up today very well. And in my opinion, it's the best Crash game of the original Naughty Dog series. I'm Pat Strikes Back, and this has been my long-awaited Crash Bandicoot 2 review. Thanks for the patience, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm out of here.